you. Uh, thank you for coming, and also thank you for staying awake directly after lunch on the second day um, at a conference. That's really good. Uh, I'd like to talk about the impact of urbanisation on biodiversity using the um, Greater Adelaide region as a case study. Uh, I, I'm doing a PhD at the University of South Australia with uh, my supervisors, David Bruce, Philip Reutman and John Boland. I apologise in advance. If I hit the wrong button, apparently something might go all black or something like that into the darkness, so um, uh, we'll try and fix that up. I'd like to start with this slide at the moment, uh, representing Eyes Wide Shut. Uh, Eyes Wide Shut is one of those things where you kind of aware that something's happening around you, but you know, just sort of vaguely, and then down the track you realise, well, actually something quite dramatic has happened, and um, it's happened while you're vaguely aware of it. So from a biodiversity point of view, this might be things like uh, a little corella, um, uh, the Australian white ibis, perhaps, um, a few other species I can think, think of that might be causing problems. And most importantly and concerning for me is um, probably the disappearance of the great Australian suburban backyard. Um, you may remember Eyes Wide Shut was also the name of a movie a few years ago. Uh, some of you can remember back that far. Someone told me last year that she'd actually seen the movie 19 times, which means I think she should be in line for a medal um, after doing that. So normally we, in-house we call this birding the birds. So I'm um, working out of the Discovery Circle, which is Citizen Science Laboratory at University of South Australia, and the uh, Discovery Circle is um, supported by um, Cities of Marin Salisbury. At the uh, Adelaide Mount Lockley Range Natural Resource Management Board, Department of Environment and Water. I think I managed to get that right. And obviously the University of South Australia. So what's the problem? Well, at the moment, about half of the world's population live in cities. And the UN predicts that by 2050, this is going to be about two-thirds of the world's population. Australia is already highly urbanised. We're about 89 90%. And most of our cities um, are like that. Rapid urbanisation tends to um, have a negative impact on biodiversity. Most people believe that biodiversity is good and respond posit positively to biodiversity. So the task is, all, can we optimise urbanisation for biodiversity? So if we have to put farm homes for lots of extra people, can we make sure that we can do that so we can fit the people in but also not damage biodiversity and hopefully even have a positive, um, positive effect on that. But how do we go about doing this? And most importantly, what's the real relationship or relationships between urbanisation and biodiversity? Bearing in mind that this is likely to be different from one um, city to another. Uh, that scene, by the way, the image is actually um, an apartment block in Hong Kong. And I believe that um, the centre part of it's in shadow most of the time. I don't think we'll get to the same level of urbanisation here in Australia. Well, not, not soon anyway. What we've done in the past is, with suburbs, we have tended to follow what's on the, so I think it's your left-hand side, called land sharing, where um, if you look at the little uh, multicoloured dots at the top, we have various bits of green, which op op often um, represent backyards, for backyard vegetation, for example. So we've got those mixed up. Um, with houses and other impervious kind of stuff. So underneath on the left-hand side, that's kind of what that urban scene would look like from above. But when you have to put a lot more people in, that leads to uh, quite dramatic and generally quite bad urban sprawl. So these days, most, um, most planners and, and government departments that I've come across tend to be favouring what's happening on the right-hand side the land sparing. So the idea is what we'll do is we'll pack a lot more people into a relatively small area, but we'll try and leave space for bigger patches of green. So you end up seeing what's happening there. So that's what tends to be followed at the moment. The only thing is, though, um, well, most of that's probably fairly positive, but the impacts on biodiversity are generally not well known. We also don't know what sort of quality that green space should be. 
We also need to know how they're connected to other green spaces as well. Just leaving a big blob of green in an urban landscape is not in itself, uh, I think, good enough um, to be able to meet the needs of biodiversity. But that tends to be what's happening at the moment. But there are um, many positive signs to land sparing, but um, the jury is very much out, I think, still for biodiversity. Maybe I... All right. Uh, so we're looking at um, the Greater Adelaide region as a case study. It's approximately 9,000 square metres. It contains just over 80% of the state's population. So if you look right on the outside, right up top and around, that's the Greater Adelaide region. Um, and if you look closer, you'll find that there's a patch around more the inner part of the city with a, a red um, band around there. So that's the inner part. And the government, with their population strategies, handling those two areas differently. What they um, <coughs> do want to do is, over the next 25 to 30 years, they're talking about trying to accommodate an extra half a million people. That's a little bit of a robbery figure, but um, that's around about the mark. Who will probably need an extra quarter of a million dwellings. Uh, they're looking for, in the in inner part of um, Adelaide, about a 76% infill ratio. Uh, but still consuming about 15,000 hectares of new land. So the way they're handling this from the inner part um, are two different strategies. So one's the classic one of densification, which I'll cover in a minute. You take a um, standard housing block with a standard one house on it, um, which has a big backyard, and you might knock that house over and put two, maybe three dwellings on there. So that's represented by the strategy number one. The second strategy is if your house is within about 800 metres of a major transport corridor, then you're in for a lot of fun because they're really looking at three to five storey apart, um, apartment blocks along there. I don't know if any of you have been down along um, Churchill Road in recent times, you'll see this playing out before your, your very eyes. So that's how they're handling the, the bit in the, inter, in the um, inner urban part of the, um, of the area. In the outside part of it, these little um, red polygons or red areas are basically in rural areas where they're um, targeting. And you'd probably see that a sort of classic uh, urban sprawl, but with a bit, of a, a bit of a twist to it. So those are three strategies they're adopting for the next 25 to 30 years. So strategy number one, this is classic infill. So some of you might be, um, you probably still see this in, in a few suburbs classic uh, backyard, um, hills hoist, almost obligatory, um, barbecue out the back, sometimes even trucks running around the place. So it's a bit maligned in recent times, but I actually quite like the um, suburban backyard. It takes up a lot of space, but these circles represent, uh, in this case, I think seven different layers of vegetation texture and structure that's in there. And imagine you have a whole suburb or streets of these where all the backyards line up. So you have these long corridors of um, greenness with lots of different um, vegetation layers and some complexity associated with that. If you get rid of those, you lose, of course, most of that. The second strategy, this is on Churchill Road. Uh, I took this a couple of months ago. This house may not exist anymore. Um, house, big backyard, it's going to be turned into, as you can see, two lots of um, three-storey apartments because this is within 800 metres of a railway line. You'll notice that um, even though there might be a couple of trees outside of that sort of graphic they're putting up, there's not much room for any sort of green stuff that's in there. I'll just cover this very quickly. Actually, if I go back one, you'll see right to the left-hand side there's a red roof place there. Um, that's the gate to that red roof place. On the other side of it, there's another set of apartment blocks being built, uh, built, so I think they'll be finished now. So that house presumably hasn't sold out yet, but what do you think their chances are when they're going to be bounded either side um, by three or four storey apartment blocks? That's okay though, we're told, because around Adelaide we have lots of parks, recreational parks. Um, this is one just across the road. Most of our recreational parks were never set up from a biodiversity point of view, even though they're being talked about that. They were set up primarily for, sorry, um, for recreational use uh, and also aesthetics. So if you're lucky, you end up getting two, um, two layers of, uh, of structure out of that. 
Uh, classic urban sprawl, this is up in Adelaide Hills. And you can see that we have large houses on small blocks. In this particular case, there's still a few trees that are left along existing road. I think that's been filled in now. What we do have so is some green urban space, which is on the right-hand side, yes, which is generally mainly grasses and a few trees, if you're lucky. Uh, so we've started about trying to um, assess the biodiversity here, try and come up with some strategies for handling this. Um, we're looking at using birds as a biodiversity measure and to uh, develop a whole range of tools and data collection methods, um, do the analysis using um, two methods, which I'll talk about very, very briefly in a minute, and come up with some recommendations. Uh, basically, use 11 land classes. Um, as you can see, the agricultural, two lots of parklands, coastal areas, and then stratified on the basis of human population density for residential areas. So these range from extremely low density to extremely high density as well. And on the uh, picture you see there, those different colours represent different types of human population density and also land classes as well. Uh, just a close up, you can see Adelaide's quite patchy. The blue ones, space is generally fairly, fairly low density development, and the yellow and red ones uh, represent much higher uh, population densities. Uh, one of the problems of looking at um, using birds as an um, indicator for biodiversity is that you've got to count them and they often don't want to stay in the same spot at the same time. Um, we also wanted to get a year's worth of data for this, so four seasons. Uh, in the end, using um, the services of citizen scientists, are actually able to detect 103 different bird species in the Adelaide, Adelaide region, which is more than I expected, and counted about 20,000 birds from 165 different sites. Uh, the first part of the analysis is a fairly standard one called uh, urban rural or natural gradient analysis. So on the left hand side we're looking at natural and rural zones. We generally find that we have a large number of species but fairly small numbers of each species there and they're fairly, usually endemic or, or certainly native. And as you go more towards the higher population areas, towards the urban centres, then what you would normally find is that the number of birds increases quite dramatically but the number of species drops off dramatically as well. Um, and you get a few little bumps along the way. That's what we, we actually expect to find. Uh, usually um, there are three classes of organisms, so in this case we'll talk about birds. Have the urban explorers that love urban areas, so the feral pigeon or the rock dove. The urban adapters, these are the birds that um, can uh, cope with changing conditions. Um, and also the urban avoiders, so they tend to uh, shoot through and um, head for the hills, literally, if they, if they can actually do that. Uh, just very briefly, the um, birds that we found in terms of numbers, uh, there's probably no, um, no prize for this, uh, but the rainbow lorikeet was the number one bird in terms of numbers across Adelaide. All in that top part of it, they're all urban adapters, except for the feral pigeon, which is an urban exploiter. Down the bottom are the number of sites, so the spread um, that these are turning up as well. So the rainbow lorikeet is um, doing pretty well, closely followed by the noisy miner. These are some of the birds that um, you just don't see. Uh, in fact, um, I think we saw all of these, uh, but in very, very small numbers. So they tend to be the smaller birds um, and the honey eaters. So what we found with the categorical analysis is that as we go from uh, more native and rural sites to more urban sites, the number of bird species drops off by a third. All right, we expect that. The number of birds drops off by 43%, which we didn't quite expect. The number of urban adapters actually drop by 53%, and the number of urban sensitive birds, those little small ones, actually drop by a massive 85%. So that was actually quite a surprise. And just to um, finish, uh, finish off, that was one part of the analysis. The next part is to try and map where um, these birds actually are, so developing species distribution maps. Uh, this one you see here is for the, um, the rock dove. So the warmer colours indicate that you're much more likely to see the birds in these, um, these areas, and the darker colours are where you're not likely to find them based on the ones that we actually collected. So what we do is, is um, <coughs> work these out, 
um, for the species that we're interested in having a look at. Um, then do some um, uh, scenario planning in, um, in um, ArcGIS and then work out species distribution maps again and see what actually literally disappears and those that actually end up benefiting by um, urbanisation. Uh, just to show you, just to finish off, the urban avoider, so they seem to be strongly associated with spring rainfall. So this is just looking at species distribution maps primarily based on climatic data. There's some other layers that I have to put in yet. And you can see that that red and yellow spot is actually Mount Lofty. So they seem to be highly influenced by good spring rainfall. The New Holland honey eater, which is a small bird but a classic urban adapter, um, <coughs> it tends to be based more on um, minimum temperatures in spring and winter. But there's still a little bit more work to do that. Those white dots indicate the training sites that the software has used um, to try and um, work out these species distribution maps. Uh, just a few of the many environmental variables that seem to go into this. The ones in yellow seem to be the most important ones, and in particular vegetation structure, but I'm still um, trying to work that out. Uh, the insight so far is urban exploiters don't seem to respond um, very much to big climatic factors, so there are other things happening there, probably um, just roosting sites and things. Urban adapters do seem to respond to temperature. Urban avoiders seem to respond to rainfall. Um, the urban bird biodiversity response is actually quite complex, um, and also I'd just urge you to, to keep your eyes open to changes happening around us, and particularly the great Australian disappearing backyard. Um, I'll build it through this fairly quickly, but if you're interested, you can catch up with me a bit later. I normally bring in my plastic, um, plastic owl, but it was a bit of a handful today, so I can tell you about that afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Thank you.